Coming into this video, you already know about two clustering algorithms, k-means and spectral clustering. With k-means, we can easily distinguish round blobs of clusters, as seen in this example. We set k to 3 and obtain three clusters, just as we wanted. But if we take a closer look, we can see that the bottom left cluster could also potentially be divided into two separate clusters. Alright, let's choose k equal to 4. Well, seems about right. But what if we want to say that those two smaller clusters are somewhat related to each other, maybe in some kind of hierarchical structure? They are clearly different to the other clusters, but close enough to have some sort of relation, right? Clustering techniques such as k-means are considered partitional algorithms. This means that the algorithm finds all the clusters simultaneously and does not consider any hierarchical structure or nested clusters. This is where hierarchical clustering comes into play. Hierarchical clustering can be broken down into two strategies, top-down and bottom-up. This works similar to what we discussed already for feature selection in our module about data processing. Top-down starts with a single cluster that includes all data points and gradually builds smaller clusters by division of the larger clusters. Bottom-up, on the other hand, each data point starts as its very own cluster and gradually connects with other clusters to build larger ones. But how does this work in practice? Let's consider a simple example of five data points. We start by computing a notion of distance or dissimilarity for all data points. For example, we can use the Euclidean distance. We compute the distance for all data point pairs, obtaining a matrix that contains all of the respective values. And this is all we need for our algorithm. For our simple example, we will proceed with the bottom-up strategy. As a first step, we make each data point belong to its very own cluster. This makes our dataset split into five distinct clusters. Now we will start aggregating clusters step by step. Do we have an idea of where we would want to start building a bigger cluster? If you were looking at our two closest clusters, then you are completely on track. Based on our distance matrix that we computed earlier, we can now select the two clusters with the lowest distance to each other and merge them into a new, bigger cluster. So let's continue with the next step. But wait, how do we know the distance of our new cluster to the other data points? At the beginning, this was easy as we only had one data point per cluster, but now we have a cluster that contains two data points. There are multiple ways of computing the distance between two clusters for this purpose. We could, for example, use the minimum distance between two clusters. This means that we compare the distances of all data point pairs, where each data point belongs to a different cluster, and take the smallest distance. In our example, this would come down to the distance between data point 2 and 3. Another possibility would be to use the maximum distance between two clusters. And this is basically the same procedure as before, but instead of choosing the smallest distance, we take the biggest one now, or in our case, the distance between data point 1 and 3. Or we could also use the average distance. For this, we just take the distances of all the data point pairs and compute the average. Ok, one last. We could use the centroid of the clusters and compute the distance between both centroids. As a recap, the centroid, or center point, is the coordinate of a cluster that minimizes the variance. Ok, enough of that. Let's continue with clustering our dataset. We will proceed with the minimum distance between two clusters. Our next cluster forms by merging data points 4 and 5, as they have the smallest distance. For the next step, we will merge our cluster containing data point 4 and 5 with data point 3. We now have two clusters, where one contains two data points and the other three. As there is not much choice left for now, our last step is to merge those two clusters and obtain one big cluster containing all of our data points. So what now? Well, we can now use a so-called dendrogram, which is a diagram representation of a tree structure to compactly represent our clustering procedure. In this diagram, the different data points and clusters are grouped together at different heights. This means, starting from the bottom, we first merge data point 1 and 2 to a cluster. In the next step, we merge data point 4 and 5, which are then subsequently merged with data point 3. The final step is then to connect the two remaining clusters. And with this representation, we can now decide how many clusters we want to have. So let's say we want to have two clusters. We can cut the dendrogram at the second to last iteration to obtain the clusters containing points 1 and 2 and the clusters containing points 3, 4 and 5. You might correctly notice that different to k-means, we do not need to choose the number of clusters in the beginning with hierarchical clustering. Instead, we can obtain a different number of clusters just by cutting the dendrogram at different steps. 
While the obtained clusters might not necessarily be better than the ones from k-means or other algorithms, hierarchical clustering offers more flexibility and the possibility to investigate the hierarchical structure of our data. Well, and that's all I have to say for this video. For the remaining videos in this module, we will talk about two popular dimensionality reduction methods.